Good morning. Good morning. And happy Mother's Day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your presence here this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would lead us into all truth. May you fill our hearts and minds, and may you sanctify our souls by your truth. Your word is truth. We ask your help as we discuss and think about these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you were in Christ Church, the city or town of Christ Church, where would you be? What country? You're in Christ Church. What? Oh, so what? No, no, no. It's an actual town. <clears throat> Where? New Zealand. Christ Church, New Zealand. Christ Church. Can you imagine? I that's a good place to be from. Now, I'm asking a question today. If the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the focal point of all time, then what about the church? Is the church the focal point too? No, correct. What is it then? If the focal point is Christ, then the church is the what? What is the church? What's the metaphor? The bride. It's the bride, of course. Christ's work is the church's foundation, right? And he is the point in which all history is to be understood. But does Christ's work continue in and through the church? It should, correct. And the mystery of the fullness of the redemption of God's people is disclosed by and through the church. The church is the stage upon which redemption is played out. Listen to what Paul says. To me, though I am very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. What does that mean to you? When he's talking about the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, who is he referring to? Demons and? So does the, de does the devil know the, the end and the beginning? No. I mean, the Lord does, of course, and we do, but the enemy doesn't. So the enemy's listening closely. How about that? Did you ever think of that thought? The church is the most important body or group on the face of the earth. More important than any government, more important than any organization, any national, international corporation, the church universal is the most important body on the earth. And if you're a Christian this morning, you are part of that most important body. And so um, the fullness of God's wisdom is being revealed in the church even now and the principalities and powers, even the angels, 
are scrutinizing the church to learn of the wisdom and plan of God revealed there. We have a great and blessed privilege and duty to know his plan and to make it known. Amen? Amen? To make it known. It is though the church is a stage upon which God has been presenting the great drama of redemption, a pageant to show those who have rebelled against God and wrecked the universe are now being brought back into harmony with him, becoming agents of renewal and healing instead. How do you like that? The church. We are the verifying data of God's grace. God's will for you and me is to be agents of his wisdom, to show that truly we are the capstone of his creation, that men may behold us as the masterpiece of God. We have been redeemed with such a salvation that in the midst of a sinful and crooked world, we can become the sons of God without rebuke, demonstrating the marvelous salvation of which we speak, that we might become, as it were, the picture book leading people to the written book that they, by the Holy Spirit, might come to know the living book, even Jesus. Have you heard the old adage? that you might be the only Jesus they ever see. You might be the only Bible they ever read. So, does the church have an Old Testament background? Yes. Is it important? Yes. The church is the creation of the historical Christ and dates from the time of Christ, has its roots in the Old Testament and cannot be understood well without that background. Why? Because the church is the ecclesia. If you talk about the study of church, it's called ecclesiology, right? from the word ekklesia, ek in Greek means from or out of, we are people who are called out. We are called out of the world. If you're a Christian this morning, you have been called out of the world. You have been called out. Who else was famously called out? He was just an idolater, an Ur of the Chaldees hanging out, doing his idolatrous things when he was called out. God said, hey you, pick it up, we're leaving. He's the father of the faithful. The little kids know it. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons. <laughs> right? There's old Abe just sitting there in the air of the Chaldees, and God said, you, you son, out, you coming with me. We're going to go to a new place. I'm going to make a people out of y'all. I'm going to make a people. God is making a people for his own self who we will dwell among. We're being made a people fit for God. The call of God followed by the responses of the ones called and God's solemn covenant with them to bless them, to be their God and they his people. It says it all over the Bible. So we're the assembly, and if I can say it this way, without reference to the denomination, we are the ecclesia of Yahweh. We are the assembly of God. With the called out ones. And as a result, we think differently. We live differently. We have different motives. We have a different destiny. We have different duties. We have a different principle. 
right? We're, we're agents of a principle and our the principle has changed. It used to be us, but now we've gotten off the throne and uh, he's on it and now we're working for him, Amen. right? You know, the illustration of the chair. Who's on the chair? You, God, or the devil? Um, we see this in the call of Abraham. They just go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Wait a minute. He's got everything there. His people are there. And he's got to leave. Whoa. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Does it take faith to say yes? If God said to you, Aaron, I'm calling you to Zimbabwe, take you and your family and go to Zimbabwe, like next week, <laughs> quit your job, quit everything, and go to Zimbabwe, you may go, what? It can happen. Okay, the creation of an ecclesia an assembly of those who are called out of a normal relationship to the world in order to be a special people of God. That is the church. The call is accompanied by special promises and must be met by faith, worship, love, and obedience from those to whom the call comes. And the church is founded on who? Jesus, it's founded on Christ and it's called into being by the Holy Spirit. Every Christian who is called to become a Christian is called by the blessed Holy Spirit. And different from the Old Testament ecclesia, what's big? What's bigly different? New word I just made up this morning. What's bigly different? Come on now, you got it. Who do they call out in the old days? Jesus said, I've come to the lost sheep of Israel. Sorry, honey, I can't. Right? The old... for the sick. No. He said, I came for the lost sheep of Israel. Remember the girl, the little girl said, hey, even the dogs eat the crumbs from under the table. And Jesus said, I haven't seen that faith. But he said, I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. The Old Testament calling out was of who? Jews. Israel. Now, is it limited? No. Are you a Jew? I ain't a Jew. I'm a Gentile. I eat pork. Lots of it. And, <laughs> and I'm an Italian. I eat cured pork, which is probably not good for me. But I can't stop it now. I eat shellfish. Oysters on the half shell. Still alive. Raw and wriggling, baby. I guess it goes for <laughs> Tabasco, a lemon. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, this new people is from every nation, tribe, and tongue, right? And increasingly, I think in America, you're going to see people in your local church, and it's going to look more like the globe. It already is looking more like the globe. People from all different nations pouring into America and pouring into the American church. Amen. Right? Which is a good thing. It's a very good thing. So Matthew 16, 18 is probably the Bible's best known text dealing with the church. Jesus had left the dangerous area of Galilee for Caesarea Philippi. We began to question his disciples. Hey, who do men say that I am? Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? Peter answered for the rest, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. His Peter, this very impetuous man, powerful man, but vacillated much, and he speaks, and wow, 
Jesus is blown away, if that could be possible. He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. If you think Jesus is the son of the living God, it's been revealed to you, not because you read a Bible, but by God. If you think you're a sinner and you know it, it's been revealed to you by God, by the Father. And I tell you that you are Peter. You are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. Okay. So does that mean Peter is the first Pope? Papa. Even the Papa. We talked about this on Wednesday night for you Wednesday nighters. Why is that true or not true? Why is Peter? Because they say that Peter was the first pope and then there's been a succession since Peter. So the present pope occupies the seat of Peter and as a result, you're in the wrong church, bro. You should be in a church down the street. A Catholic church. Roman Catholic. You be in a wrong church. Here's the problem with this. Are you ready? Where's something, something to always tuck into your mind is that you're reading an English Bible and you can get tripped up with only an English Bible. Because the word Peter means something to do with rock and rock means something to do with rock. So if you're just reading English, you think, you are rock, and on this rock, I will build my church, right? Sounds right, doesn't it? So now you're in the wrong church? I'm not the Pope. I'm not wearing a hat, a day gone. I've never been a soul. I'm still a Catholic, they say, because you, be, you can't become an un-Catholic, you know. If you convert to Protestantism... <laughs> And you say to your, your local parish and say, can you take me off the Roman Catholic rules? They say, get out of here. You can't be. They won't. People have sued in court to get off the list, and you're not off. You'll be on the list till the day you die. But it doesn't matter. That was just an aside. The problem here is this, right? Peter is... Petros, rock is Petra. When you see O and A in a language, what's usually the difference? One is feminine and one is masculine. Did you know that most languages Every word is either feminine or masculine. Did you know that? Italian, all Romance languages, which come from Latin, every word is feminine or masculine. Not so in English, right? Um, and because English is what? It's kind of based off of what? What's the big language of a lot of... German. Good with love. Kind of a German. And German's a non romance language. So, boy, basically you have two words. One's masculine and one's feminine. You would never know that from the Bible. It doesn't say Mrs. Rock and it doesn't say Mr. Rock. <laughs> but with it comes great precision because Petra does not mean the same thing as Petros. A Petros is a small stone. A Petra is bedrock. So he's saying, you are a small stone, and on this bedrock, I will build my church. You would never know that. You could, if you got a, like a, a concordance or something, or a study Bible, you probably see that in there. You could figure that out. You don't have to actually know Greek to know that, right? So... Um, it's not on Peter himself. 
It's on the insight, the special revelation given to him. And here's the explanation, right? Uh, Petros, the masculine form, it's stone. Could be a big stone, little stone. Uh, Petra, the feminine firm, form, meant bedrock. You are Peter, a little quarried stone, solid, solid in this confession at least, but easily moved. I, by contrast, am the living rock of ages. That's why we sing to him. And on that solid foundation, which your confession points to, I will build my church. That's if you were doing a sophisticated message translation of the Bible so people would not be misled. So that's why we saying, you know, Christ is the foundation of the church. But the stone, which was rejected by the builders, has become the head of the corner or the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Can a person who is not a Christian but has lived a good and righteous life and sweet as a peach go to heaven one day? No. Are you sure? You don't know Jesus. Like strange knocking on the door to let me in. At the end, they get saved. And say. um, <clears throat> Peter, in his first epistle, compares Christ to a foundation stone upon which we, as quarried stones, are being built. Uh, come to him, to that living stone rejected by men, but in God's sight chosen and precious. And like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house. We're being built into a house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What is one of our spiritual sacrifices? Yeah. What does that lead to? If we, if we, Surrender our own will. What does it lead to? Obedience, what does that lead to? Romans 12, 2. In light of God's mercy. Service. Serving the Lord is sacrifice. Are we all serving the Lord? For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and he who believes in him will not be put to shame. The world will shame you right now yeah. and say, You are a dork for believing this stuff. Well, you know what? Nah, bro. Rosive, you're really wrong. Um, okay. So they, Jesus told uh, everyone that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. And Peter said what? He made a great answer just a little while ago. And now he says, God forbid, Lord. <laughs> and so Peter, who got the greatest commendation by Jesus, now gets the greatest condemning by Jesus. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. The first of Peter is Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you're not on the side of God, but of men. You see that? So Peter, you know, he wasn't infallible. He didn't get everything right. But he got that very wrong. Um, the person and work of Jesus is the church's foundation, the assembled body of those for whose sins he died to make atonement. And he did it, of course, on the cross. And we are united to him, to the crucified Christ. And we should be different if we are indeed different. So, this is not like some kind of like 
plea saying to you, be different, so be sure you're saved. No, if you're not different, then you might want to take a look under the hood. Right? But if you are different, then you can rejoice in the fact that you are. Correct? It's a diagnostic. Okay. There is one church, correct? I know. There's one church to all who confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. There's one true church. What do we call that? The church universal. This is the church local. This is a local expression of church. But the universal church, you should have membership in two churches. The local church and the universal church. If you're a true Christian and you're a member of the local church, you're in the universal church. But if you're a fake Christian and you have membership in the local church, you ain't a member of the universal church. And that's a bad thing. Nothing in the Bible tells us that there should be or even that we should desire to have one denomination, right? So don't get hung up on that. Um, God's people, do we need one another? Of course. Desperately. That's why it hurts so much when we're not there for one another. It hurts bad. Because we desperately need one another. Um, because of the love which is to bind the true church together, we have an obligation to demonstrate the love unity over and above denominational programs. Because Jesus said, by this, your love for one another, will all men know that you are my disciples. If you just the rest like everybody else, Everybody else are going to think you're just everybody else. If there's no difference in you, then there's no difference in you. It's not hard to figure out, right? And the second unique characteristic of the church is that we are empowered by who? The Holy Spirit. When Christ went up, the Spirit went down. And when he said, Jesus said, you stay here till the Spirit comes, and then you'll be my witnesses all over the place. And so empowered by the Spirit, we will be witnesses. We don't need programs. We don't need special church things. We have opportunities every day to proclaim, and you know them when you find them and see them. Will be right before your eyeballs. Could be the guy on the machine next to you. Could be your coworker at work, your client, your anybody, your friend. Um, so the Holy Spirit says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You shall be more. Does that only apply to the apostles? Plus everybody that's in it. Plus everybody? No, no, I mean, what I mean by that is the church. The church. Applies to the church. Okay, and um, is it limited? Like, you're not supposed to be, uh, um, it says the ends of the earth, so that's like everywhere, right? Okay, let me ask you this question. It came up yesterday in men's group. It's a good question. There's certain gifts in the Bible, right? One gift is pastor-teacher. It's a gift, right? If, you know, if I'm a pastor-teacher, then I should have been I'm gifted to be one. This is my, it's my calling, right? It's not yours, necessarily, unless you're going to be a pastor-teacher. But if, uh, these other ones, too, apostle, but um, that went away. Why did that go away? Because one of the requirements of an apostle was to see the risen Christ. How many have seen the risen Christ after he rose? Only one name. Paul. But it has an evangelist is a, is a calling too. Called to be an evangelist. 
How many here are called to be an evangelist? Called specifically your job as evangelist? You're going to go evangelize? Okay. What? Okay, so what does that mean? Does that mean that if I'm not called to be an evangelist, then I don't go to evangelism school and I go to some place to be an evangelist? Does that mean I don't have to talk about Jesus to anybody? Am I off the hook because it's not my gift? No. And do I, in my own heart, say, well, it's kind of unnatural for me to talk about my faith with other people. Sometimes it's awkward. Does that mean I'm not gifted, therefore I don't have to do it, therefore I get a buy? Lots of scriptures say so. Um, does it mean that it would might not go so well at the bar of heaven if I don't speak a word for Jesus ever to anybody? So if you don't, if you don't <laughs> speak to Jesus, I mean speak about Jesus and don't use your gift. Doesn't the Bible say that the gift that you use is a national truth? If you are ashamed of me and my words, then I will be ashamed of you. So we're empowered to speak. And nobody's, like, uh, exempt, right? And that's how you grow a church, by the way. Not by a program. Not by, you know, special, let's have a yard sale or a chicken barbecue. That's not how you do it. You do it by each person in their own little world, talking to others about Jesus. And when they get to a point inviting them into the gathered flock for further discipling. And you can be discipling other people and should be because every Christian is a discipler and a disciplee. True? Who are you discipling? Don't tell me. Uh, You can think about that. Every person should have in their life a Paul and a Timothy. One who's discipling them and one who they're discipling. How's that? Okay, more more fine print. Um, um, The Holy Spirit does three things in the church in all times and all places. The first thing is he empowers the church to do Christ's bidding and to be effective in doing it, right? That's why he said, wait here until the Spirit comes. Second, the Holy Spirit does what uh, in the people of God? What does he do? He's doing it right now. Uh, Yeah, but um, more importantly, what's happening? Huh? Yeah, teaching us, transforming us. He's sanctifying us by his word, right? And that we talked about that, well, at least in Westboro. We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. The more you look at Jesus in his word, the more you get transformed in your heart. And finally, uh, somebody said it, I think, the Spirit is not only our teacher sanctifier, he's not only the one that gives us the power to do what Christ wants, because we can't do anything of what he wants without his help. And if you can't do what he wants, for goodness sake, just ask him. You know what happens to me on, when I prepare a sermon? I'll start preparing a sermon. I get ideas. And I'm like... You idiot. I haven't even asked the Lord to give me the words to say. So sometimes I'm good. I'll do it at the outset. Sometimes I'm not. And I have to stop and say, time out. Number 36, offense. Penalty. Failure to pray. Right? And so anyway, um, what else is he? The comforter. The comforter. And he will comfort you. Especially in the, in the fact that you're not perfect, right? You are a work in progress, and nobody's got it all down here. Goodness, we don't mean that. 
We don't mean that everybody here is sinless. We don't mean that. Um, you know, but he comforts you and says, you're my child still, bro. No, he doesn't say that. But you're my child. Uh, don't lose it, okay? <laughs> More fine print. Let's see. Um, so the Church of Christ, what kind of an organization is it? It's a spiritual one, right? It's a spiritual one. And unlike the Old Testament version, it includes all people. All people. May we have no barriers. What about, what do you mean all people? Does it include men and women? Yes. Does it include those who speak different languages? Yes. Did it include those who have different cultures? Yes. And some of those cultural things are pretty formidable, right? You Let me just give you really a tough one. I'm sorry, I like to do these kind of things. It's a personality defect. <laughs> In America, we'd have a, let's say we had a fellowship meeting and your dog came, you know, oh, it's your dog, Fido. If there was a Korean guy there, Up, right? I, I need. I don't need to say anymore. <laughs> you get it. <laughs> Notice the different cultures, but they shouldn't impede our ability to fellowship as one church. William Barclay, you know who William Barclay is? Great commentator on the scriptures. Talks about uh, a life, an incident in the life of Egerton Young the first missionary to the Indians of Saskatchewan. How many have been to Saskatchewan? Canada. Really? Cool. Young had gone to them with the message of the love of God of the Father, and they received it like a new revelation. When he told his message, an old chief said, when you spoke of the great spirit just now, did I hear you say, our father... Yes, I did, said the missionary. We know him as Father because he is revealed to us as Father by Jesus Christ. This is very new and sweet to me, said the chief. We never thought of the great spirit as Father. We heard him in the thunder. We saw him in the lightning, the tempest, and the blizzard, and we were afraid. So when you tell us, that the great spirit is our father, that is very beautiful to us. We, th we knew God was powerful. We thought he was arbitrary and capricious. We thought he was so transcendent, we couldn't know him. But now we know him as father? The chief paused and then asked, missionary, did you say that the great spirit is your father? I did, said Young. And said the chief, did you say that he is the father of the Indians? Yes, said the missionary. Now the chief is firing on all eight cylinders and comes up with a logic that's inescapable. Then you and I are brothers. You are a brother or a sister to every Christian in the world today, more real than your blood brother or blood sister. Amen? And when you get to heaven, you're going to know that experientially. So, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great doctor from England, says we are all equally sinners, we are all equally helpless, we have all come to one and the same Savior, we have the same, we have the same salvation, we have the same Holy Spirit, we have the same Father, we even have the same trials. And finally, we are all marching and going together to the same eternal home, right? We're going to the same place, bro. 
Some may get there before others. Only a knowledge of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ will draw us together. Christ's church. Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you for these truths that transform. We pray that you would transform us in Christ's name.